was up everybody so glad you're here welcome to the show week of november 10th 2023 tomorrow or november 11th is veterans day so make sure to reach out to a veteran and say thanks for your service Uh, This week's episode is going to be a little bit of baseball, a little bit of basketball, and of course it's Football Friday, so, or in this case, Football Saturday morning by the time this thing drops, so it's football time, right? I'm actually really enjoying these weeks of talking football. It's been a little fun this fall, being able to do that and bring you my opinion on things, so that's been great and uh feedback's been really good so i appreciate everybody that's been listening to it downloading it as well uh, also if you're new to the show make sure to hit that follow button or subscribe uh whatever you need to do on wherever you're listening to this podcast at and then make sure to ring the bell so that way you're notified when new episodes are dropped uh I try to drop them usually on friday mornings this one's getting a little bit out late uh was that nephew's football game today and for the south dakota state high school football championship for class 11b uh came up a little short lost 13 to 7 so heartbreaker there but the boys will be back next year i'm sure as they were last year with state champs this year runner up so might as well be state champs again next year um so uh this show is uh a main topic is going to be about the being an la clippers fan and how uh how miserable that is some years and even though we have james harden doesn't guarantee that we are going to win a championship as already um we're zero and two this week uh, since the trade we lost to the knicks and the nets um with harden only scoring 12 and 15 points each i think or 17 i can't remember what he scored that first game we did score only 12 against the nets so a little bit of that as well but before we get into it about the Clippers. And before we get into my NFL picks for the week, let's talk about the Otani sweepstakes. Shohei Otani, Otani, the highest priced free agent signee that's going to happen this winter. Um, everybody's speculating where he's going to go. Yankees, Dodgers, Cubs are now in the mix. Um, apparently, from a source, from a source, from a source on my Twitter feed or my X feed, how you want to look at it, I refuse to call it X, it's still Twitter. Just doesn't have the bird, which I really, really wish they bring him back, Larry Bird. Um, so uh, the U Darvish has apparently talked to Otani about Chicago and how nice it is. Yet, as one Twitter uh, post said, well, if, Ota- if D- Darvish likes Chicago so much, why did he re up with the Padres? Good point. So, I mean. We got that going for us. So, as a Cubs fan, I don't think Otani is going to end up with the Chicago Cubs. As a foreigner, on a as a Yankees fan on the outside, um, as a outside Yankees fan, I don't know how I want to phrase that. Like, I don't hate the Yankees; they're not my favorite team, but they're definitely a top four team of mine that I definitely like. Um, as, as everybody, you know, if you're not aware, uh, Yankees would have been a Yankees fan if not for WGN happening, uh, coming on in 1982, my grandparents were getting cable and, uh, my grandpa's starting to watch Cubs games every single day. Cause he was up, he was a Yankees fan up to that point. So, and whenever the Yankees were in the world series, we rooted for the Yankees. So, I mean, and the, the, the Yankee pinstripes are in the blood a little bit. The cubby blue just bleeds a little harder. So, I don't think Otani comes to the Cubs. I don't think he ends up with the Dodgers. The Dodgers made a push for him when he first first came over, and he didn't want to go there. I definitely think he ends up in Seattle, though. Seattle is going to be the key here to me. Uh, Seattle is definitely the the team with the best infrastructure for it. The team that uh, has already done it once with Ichiro Suzuki, plus the fact that he likes Ichiro as well. So, I mean, that's where we're, that's where I feel like we're at, and uh, I really do believe that Ichiro ha- has a huge influence over that. So, really believe. I mean, like I said, I don't believe 
Ichiro has an influence over it. I mean, let's be real. Uh, Ichiro is Ichiro, and he uh, he does have some value there being in Seattle as part of the organization still. Definitely a guy that has been around the block or two. Definitely um, it's a guy that, as I've said before, Otani looks up to as well. So when you put those factors into place, it's easy to see that uh, he would be a great fit for for Seattle. Plus, you throw out there with Julio Rodriguez, uh, that young pitching staff in a couple of years when Otani is able to pitch again, and they have the money and the funds to do it. So I really think that that's where that goes. Um, so then we have uh, – we also have – um, lost my train of thought for a second there. So Seattle definitely is where Otani is going, in my opinion. Um, now let's move on to the Michigan Wolverines and their little scandal going on. Uh, obviously the Big Ten has came down with their punishments. It's a institutional punishment. However, Jim Harbaugh is head coach, so therefore he has to serve the punishment. And he has a three-game suspension, basically been suspended for the rest of the regular season. Uh, cannot coach on the sidelines, but can be around the team during the week, so he's able to coach practices. I don't know how much of big of a deal that's going to be, but we're going to find out tomorrow when Michigan State plays Penn – or not Michigan State – when Michigan plays Penn State um, on Fox at 11 a.m. Central Time. It's going to be the big noon Saturday game. So – this whole scandal is, as I said, as I said last week, you look at SMU and that whole situation and the death penalty and whatnot. I don't think Michigan gets the death penalty. Definitely some wrongdoing there. Always any wrongdoing always falls on the head coach as he's in charge of the entire program, whether he was involved in it or not. AKA Rick, um, see Rick Pitino, see, uh, um, Calipari, see Bill Self, like see all those big basketball coaches that have all in the past years had that problem where it's a, um, I can't think of the word of it, but it's like the program's not under control type thing. So I think the NCA also had levies of levies, a penalty and maybe a fine against Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines, um, that will take place next year. Obviously it's late in the season now that I don't think they'll do anything there. Oh, let's talk about Nebraska football since we're on the Big Ten side of it. Nebraska football comes into this weekend playing against Maryland. Uh, they still have an inside chance at winning the Big Ten West and making a Big Ten conference uh, appearance as well. So, we, so Nebraska Cornhuskers fans have a slim hope. It's there. All they got to do is win their games out. They got Maryland, Wisconsin, Iowa. Um, and the Michigan State loss of the week does not help, but they still have a chance to win out and win the conference or win that division. So, could, but then they'll end up going against Michigan or Ohio State, maybe even Penn State. Penn State wins tomorrow and just and get blown out in the Big Ten championship game, which I think any team from the Big Ten West is going to get blown out by the team from the East. It's just the way it is. Now let's move on to UNLV football. UNLV football uh, still has an inside chance of making the Mountain West Conference Championship game as well. Uh, they play Wyoming. If they beat Wyoming, they still have to play. Uh, I think they play Air Force. And I can't remember the third team that they play left, but all I think they're all winnable games. Air Force might be a little tough because Air Force runs a flex bone offense. And if you don't know what a flex bone offense is, it is a variation of the wishbone offense, but instead of having a instead of having a fullback, a halfback, and a and a um, split back running back type deal in the backfield, you basically have two split split backs on the outside at the end of the lines, and then you have a running back that's that's three yards off the line of scrimmage. So they run that offense. Um, they only average about seventy five yards a game passing. So if you can start to stop the run on them like Army did and make them pass, then you have a chance to win. 
So, uh, UNLV basketball, you know, UNLV is my team, and we got to look at the fact that uh, the basketball team came out and laid an egg against Southern University the first the first uh, game of the year, which one game doesn't make a season, but a lot of losses can ruin a season. So I really feel like this team is the real deal. I still think that they can finish third through fifth in the Mountain West. Um, and I really think that they can still m- make the NCAA tournament. So you know, if you fans keep looking up, all right? Now let's look at the big news of the weekend for the NFL side, and that would be Mr. Josh Dobbs and the Minnesota Vikings. Josh Dobbs playing on his fifth, diff, playing for his fifth different organization since last year. Uh, he was on the Titan squad. He was on the Detroit Lions practice squad before that. He was a Cleveland Brown. He got traded to the Cardinals, won one game with the Cardinals against the Dallas Cowboys, and then got traded to Minnesota and came in and sub for that as well. A little bit of knowledge about Josh Dobbs is that he is a uh, Astro. Um, engineer uh basically uh dude has done two interns with nasa in his time off in his time away from football dude's a smart dude and kevin o'connell apparently was feeding him plays through the headset and i really think that he can boost that uh with a better defense than what the the vikings defense is definitely an upgrade over the cardinals defense and i think with that dobbs can actually lead them to um a uh, lead him to the playoffs. All right. So I really do think that that's a place that can happen. Uh, that I don't think the Vikings chances just proven on Sunday that they got gamers. You got Jordan Addison, Justin Jefferson. Once he's back, uh, you still have Alexander Madison in the backfield and you have a pretty good defense. It's not as the defenses that it was, but it's a pretty good defense. So Vikings fans should have no worries about that. Next, we got to talk about the, I had my little tangent about the Raiders last week, and that was a good thing. Antonio Pierce came out and fired the boys up, and we put up 21 points in the, 21 or 24 points in the first half, which is more points than we scored in an entire game all year. Um, so, and then we went out, and I don't understand, it was the Giants. A lot of people are like, well, it was the Giants, and, Blah blah blah. However, we did lose to the Bears a couple years ago, a couple weeks ago. So, and we got humiliated by the Lions. So, beating the Giants is actually pretty good. Uh, they got four wins. I, they have the Chiefs twice, the Dolphins, and uh, the Broncos. So, with AP as our head coach and the team buying in, really hope he gets the interim tag removed. Hope that he becomes the head coach permanently. Hope. Um, and we can keep moving forward instead of keep having transition at coaches. And as long as – and the guy was from Compton. He has won two Super Bowls as a player. He was a very great – he was a very good linebacker. And he was a Raiders fan growing up. So, I think that all should factor in. And I think Mark Davis should take that into account. If I had to say, I would definitely tell Mark Davis, watch how the season ends. Don't – don't pull a Rich Bashia and fire the guy. Uh, let's let's see how the season ends. If Antonio Pierce can make a run and beat either the Dolphins or the Chiefs or both at some point, then he should be your next head coach. Guys are buying into it. Guys are having fun, and when guy when the players are aren't playing uptight and everything, that's they play a lot better. All right, now there's my. There's a little quick rundown of what happened this last week. A little history, current history stuff. So um, let's move on to the big article of the week that we're going to discuss, which is going to be the uh, history of the Los Angeles Clippers. Now, some of you may not know, but the Clippers are not originally from L.A. or San Diego. If you knew they were from San Diego beforehand, they originally started as the Buffalo Braves. Um, as an inaugural team in 1970. All right. They came in with the Portland Trailblazers. And um, came in with the Portland Trailblazers. And I can't remember one other team. I think the Cavs maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. 
Um, so they they were an expansion team in the seventies. They didn't uh, in their first season they won tw- they went twenty two and sixty. Second season they went twenty two and sixty, and that was Randy Smith's rookie year, probably the third or fourth best uh, Clipper of all time, is what I would have to say. Um, so we have Randy Smith uh, followed by Bob McAdoo after that. Then we would finally uh, make the playoffs in the 73, 74 season as the Buffalo Braves. And that was with Jack Ramsey as the head coach, uh, Dr. Jack Ramsey. Uh, and then he would uh, continue to have us make the playoffs for the next three years or the next two years after that. And then we started losing again. We had two more seasons, last two seasons in Buffalo. Uh, we went 57 and 107. And then the Braves were sold to a guy that used to own the Kentucky Colonels. All right. So he was, they were sold to John Way, John Y. Brown Jr., who decimated the team's roster, traded away all the stars, and drove attendance down to the point where they could break their own lease on the arena. Does that sound familiar, Oakland A's fans? Um, eventually, Brown met with the Celtics owner, and he wanted to trade franchise ownerships. Obviously, uh, moving the Celtics to L.A. was not going to be a thing. So he ends up moving, or is it San Diego, I should say. So he ends up moving the Braves to San Diego, um, and he... <laughs> He's he's a Southern California resident, and he said the reason for the move was because he wanted a shorter commute to the to the games. Yeah, all right, bro. Sounds like a great deal. But anyways, the Buffalo Braves were having troubles with because they didn't have their own arena. They were sharing an arena with at the Buffalo Memorial Auditorium, which housed the NHL Buffalo Sabers, who were really popular at the time, and also housed the Kinesis. Uh, Griffins, uh, Golden Griffins as well, and they had the Golden Griffins had priority over uh, over the Clippers for use of the of the arena, and then the Sabers obviously were more popular, so then they had they had it as well. So then the Clippers were left with home dates that was really crappy. So they moved to San Diego, where San Diego just lost their previous NBA team, which was the Rockets. The San Diego Rockets had just relocated to Houston uh, in 1971. And then they also had the San San Diego Conquistadors at some point as well. Now, how do we go from the Braves to the Clippers? Well, people in the San Diego club um, felt that Braves didn't represent San Diego correctly. So they um, had a naming contest because that sounds like a great idea as to have a naming cost contest for uh, for an NBA team rather than just figure it out. I mean, I really wish the Washington Commanders would have done that, though, because then we could have, like, the Red Tails or the Red Hawks and it would have had feather helmets, which would have been badass. So, just saying. Uh, so, the ultimate side on the Clippers, due to the great sailing ships uh, that were around San Diego Bay, obviously you can see that in some of their older uniforms, especially the Baby Blues, on the shorts, they have, they have the you can see the ship outlines and everything on those. It's actually pretty. Wish they really wore those baby blues more often. So at this point, they got a new head coach, which was Gene Shu. Um, he preferred a fast playing style style with many scoring opportunities. However, only three players started um, from the Braves started on the team, which was Randy Smith, Swin Nader, and Scott Lloyd. Uh, Bob McAdoo they had moved on from so that leads us to because you got to remember McAdoo was played for Buffalo and then got traded to the Knicks and then he played for the Knicks the Celtics the Pistons the Nets the Clip or the Lakers winning a couple titles with the Lakers and then he finished his career with Philadelphia so he only played five se- seasons with the Buffalo Braves, but he's considered one of the legends of our squad. Um, Randy Smith, however, like I said, he played almost as he played uh, 
one season in San Diego before he went to Cleveland and then New York, but then he came back to San Diego in 80, the 82-83 season and also played for Atlanta that year too. So he actually has more games with the Clippers than what McAdoo does. So, and then you got Swin Nader. Swin Nader, yeah, he's a good guy. Um, don't really know much about him. So, anyways, uh, so then, so the other startings included Kermit Washington and Sidney Wicks. And then they brought in World Be Free for a couple of years. And World Be Free, by far, is probably one of the coolest basketball names ever. He was also nicknamed the Prince of Midair, the Brownsville Bomber, and most often as referred to as All World. He grew up in Brownsville, New York, uh, went to Carnegie High School in Brooklyn, and went to Guyford College in North Carolina, where he uh, helped lead the team to an NAIA National Championship and was named MVP as, of it as well. He played for the Clippers, the 76ers, the Warriors, the Cavs, the Rockets, and the NBA. He also finished 1-2 multiple times with George Gervin um, for the scoring points title as well so world be free one of the best nicknames of a basketball player of all time in my opinion so here you have um so here you have the avid as well that now we're in the mid 70s late 70s early 80s and what ends up happening is well they get end up getting sold is what happens well, they, first of all, they bring in Bill Walton, okay? Bill Walton was a San Diego native, two years removed from winning an NBA championship and an MVP with the Trailblazers. The problem is, Bill Walton at this point started having foot injury issues, but yet we're going to bring him in, sign him as a free agent, and see what he can do. We had Pilo Paul Silas as our head coach that um, as well, and then Mal Walton missed uh, the entire season due to foot injuries um, a couple times. So then an 81-82 season brought unwelcome changes to the franchise as Levin sold the team to L.A. area real estate developer and attorney Donald Sterling. Oh yeah, this is where the fun begins. So the Clippers experience had poor play that year. Again, Walton didn't play. They were 17-64. and 64. Uh, Sterling, of course, was from L.A. Wanted to move it there, move the team to L.A., um, he had franchise mismanagement right away. On one occasion, Sterling was fined ten thousand dollars by the NBA, the largest sum ever levied by the NBA against an owner at the time for public hearing, guaranteeing the Clippers would lose enough games to contend for a high enough draft pick to select Ralph Sampson. Unfortunately, that did not happen. He was also fined for flying his players to away games and coach seats on commercial airlines which is a violation of league's CBA at the time, which also is a little ironic that the WNBA has to fly commercial <laughs> and owners get fined for filing, flying them not commercial. So that's always a fun tidbit. Um, hotels refuse to house the Clippers because of alleged non-payment. Um, bus companies in Newark once stranded the team at the airport after Sterling failed to pay pay for the previous trips and then he ended he attempted to relocate the team to los angeles in june of 82 but denied the his the nba denied his request he then filed the antitrust lawsuit against the league which he ultimately lost and then uh he the so then they what the attempted move combined with all the management issues there's an investigation of the clippers by the nba committee of the of other owners and then the committee to recommend that Sterling's ownership should be terminated, having found that he was late in paying creditors and players. However, days before a league scheduled vote in October to remove Sterling, he agreed to sell the team, and the league sought buyers who would keep the franchise in San Diego. Now this is the fun part. At the suggestion of David Stern, vice president of the NBA at the time, Sterling was able to maintain his position as owner by instead handing over operation duties of the franchise to Alan Rothenberg, who was the team's president. And then in 83, February of 83, so 
eight months after this whole fiasco goes down, right? No, or no, actually, this is all went down in September and October. So I don't know what three, five, four, five months later, Stern then calls the Clippers an a first class organization, and Sterling was no longer pursued to for his ouster. <laughs> Larry Fleischer, general counsel for the NBA Players Association, said this at the time, In all my years of involvement with the NBA, no team ever provided as much difficulties for the players than the Clippers under Sterling, and it continued to to happen as well. Sterling almost caused three strikes in one season. The team's final two seasons in San Diego um, were horrible on the court. They went 25-57 and 30, 57, and 30-52. and 52. So... So guess what Donald Sterling did this time? Well, he tried again in 1984 to move the Clippers back to L.A., which the league subsequently fined him $25 million for doing so, for violating league rules and filed a lawsuit demanding the franchise be returned to San Diego. And then the league threatened to dissolve the franchise if ownership did not comply. But just remember, in '83. David Stern said this was a first-class franchise underneath Donald Sterling. Yeah, give me a break. He, so if you all want, so you base, baseball fans of the A's, um, of any of the o- other teams that have uh, Angels, uh, any other teams that have horrible owners, the Twins at one point with Carl with the pole ads, right? Um, the Cubs at one time with the with the Tribune. No one, not a single owner, can touch how bad Donald Sterling was. Not a single owner can touch how bad that guy was. All right, This guy was horrible from the get-go, and yet the league just let him keep owning the team, which makes no sense whatsoever. So, after this all went down, Sterling then filed another antitrust lawsuit against the league for $100 million dollars. But the, thanks to, you know, Al Davis going rogue in the Oakland Raiders. Wow. You know what? It's only fitting that my favorite football and my favorite basketball team would be rogue agents, have rogue owners, apparently, that just did their own thing. However, Al Davis actually knew how to run a team. That's the difference. Al Davis ran the AFL for crying out loud at one point. Al Davis made a lot of money selling the Raiders, selling the AFL to the NFL. All right. He's the one that perpetrated all that. So, with Al Davis moving the team to Oakland, from to from Oakland uh, to L.A., and winning that lawsuit, the league didn't have anything to stand on from that point. So, Sterling was able to move, keep the team in L.A., and then he would, only had to pay a fine of $6 million, and he dropped his case and blah, blah, blah. So, we move on. So, then the Clippers begin play in 84 at the L.A. Memorial Sports Arena. They go 31 and 51 under the gin line in. And so the still had um, horrible years due to injuries um, as well. I mean, you had Derry Smith who suffered a knee injury in 85, 86. Norm Nixon knee. Marcus Johnson spinal cord the following season. They went 12 and 70 in 87, worse, which is the second worst single season record in the NBA at that time and now it's third. Thank you 2012 Charlotte Bobcats. Elgin Baylor decided to join the team as general manager and vice president of operations. Uh, Nixon suffered another injury this time with an Achilles tendon and then the number one draft pick Danny Manning had an ACL tear as well. So gotta love those 84 to 89 like Clippers where it was just horrible. So then we did the beautiful thing of we traded the rights to recently drafted Danny Ferry and Reggie Williams for Ron Harper. Okay, not bad. I can, I can get on board with that, right? So you got Harper, Ken Norman, Danny Manny, and Charles Smith, uh, who was acquired thanks to Hershey Hawkins. And in the 1990 draft, they also drafted Lloyd Vault. By the way, this is actually when I started watching the Clippers as a kid and became a Clippers fan because I had a Lloyd Vault card. And I was in love with Lloyd Vault for some reason. So about 1990 is when I became a real Clippers fan at eight years old. Because that's when I started collecting basketball cards and realized 
that there was more than just the Chicago Bulls in my area or in the NBA. Kind of like this is the same time that I stopped being a Minnesota Vikings fan because I asked my mom who her favorite football team was, and she told me the Cowboys. So I said, all right, I'll be a Cowboys fan from now on. And uh, they win three Super Bowls in four years. Everybody calls me a bandwagoner. Well, then I became a Raiders fan. What can I say? That's how we do that. All right. So, um, sorry, one of the Raiders starter jackets, the L.A. Raiders, you know, started thinking I was N.W.A. White kid from Iowa being N.W.A. So, um, Clippers made another change. Larry Brown, who was fired by the Spurs, was hired as the head coach in January 92. And he helped, uh, helped them to finish with a better record than the Lakers that year. Um, and then they also advanced to the playoffs for the first time in 16 years, even though they were eliminated in the first round by the Jazz, 3-2 to two, as well. Uh, then they made the playoffs again in 1993 with a 41 and 41 record lost in five games to the Rockets. And then Brown left for the Pacers because you know, that's what happens. And then we also, then we decided to trade Danny Manning for Dominique Wilkins because that made sense for a one year guy. You know, that's always fun. So then we had the Bill Fitch era. Okay. The Bill Fitch era had Louis Vaught, Lamont Murray, Eric Petkowski, Lorenz and Wright. You had Pooh Richardson, Tony Massenburg, Rodney Rogers, Derek Martin, and Billy and Brian Williams. So, you know, they struggled mightily, but they did make the playoffs once during this time. And they and that was a losing record at 36 and 46. And they were swept by the Jazz. Who so yeah. And then four members so unfortunately four members of that 96-97 squad are deceased. Malik Seeley died in a car accident in 2000. Kevin Duckworth died of a heart disease in 2008. Lorenzen Wright went missing and was murdered in 2010. And Dwayne Schiz, uh, Schnitzi, Schnitz, Schnitz, I don't know how to pronounce that in the last name, died from cancer in 2012. Uh, two other players suffered tragic circumstances as well. Brian Williams, um, he was believed to have been murdered by his brother while the two were vacation in 2002. And Rodney Rogers became paralyzed uh, on a dirt bike crash in 08. Unfortunate circumstances with that 96-97 squad. So we end up uh, finishing 17-65, and 65, third worst record in the league. Fitch gets fired. And you know what we do with the 98 number one draft pick? Oh, we draft Michael Ola, Olawa Candy. You want to know who was available on that 98 draft? Well, let me tell you who we could have had besides Michael Olawakandi, a unproven star out of Nigeria that went to Pacific University. I don't know. Let's see. Let's just run down the line here. Let's see. The number two person taken in the draft that year was, oh, Mike Bibby out of Arizona. I don't know. He just won a, uh, won a national title. I don't know. There's that with Miles Simon. Uh, let's see. Oh, Ray Friends, Kansas. Oh, wait, who's this? Antoine Jameson and Vince Carter, four and five. Holy, we could have had one of them. Jeez. Um, Robert Tractor Trailer, another one. Uh, Jason Williams, you know, white chocolate. The guy that could uh, have passes behind his back. Yeah, we could have had him. Larry Hughes could have had him. Oh, wait, wait. This is where it gets better yet. A couple Hall of Famers at 9 and 10 that year. Dirk Nowitzki, you know, drafted by the Bucks, traded to Dallas. Could have drafted him. Could have drafted Paul Pierce as well, you know. Just saying. L.A. guy coming home to L.A. would have made sense. But no. We go with Michael Owala Candy. The fun pick of the 98 draft, however, was my man, Ricky Davis. All right. Ricky Davis was from Davenport, Iowa, went on to play one year at Iowa and then uh, went on and got selected by the Hornets in the first round of the 98 draft at the 21st pick. What did Ricky, what did Ricky Davis do? Might you ask? Well, I mean, there was that time where he threw the basketball 
off the uh, the away backboard after a rebound just to get his just to get another rebound to get that triple double. Just saying. So there was Ricky Davis. Oh, hey, Tyron Lue was in this draft class. Jeez. We could add Rasheed Lewis, Richard Lewis, I mean, Richard Lewis. There were plenty of options besides Michael Olawa Candy. Ah, <sighs> but that's just the way that thing goes. Let me tell you. Freaking love it. So the Candyman, we end up hiring uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar to help tutor the Candyman in a second year. And guess what? Abdul Jabbar quit after one season because he said he dacked lack of improvement. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Not a fun time. So and then the Clippers decide to trade away Lamont Murray to the Cavs um, for Derek Anderson and Johnny Newman. And then Newman was also obviously off was ended up trading for Eric Murdoch. So team finished again with the worst record in the league at 15 and 67. Yeah. Yay. Clippers stick my eyes out right now because this is how bad that team was. Weren't selling any tickets. The Lakers are still running like the Lakers are just running LA at the time. Yeah. Horrible, 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 horrible. So then we move to the Staples Center, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, the good thing, though, is that since 2001, since 2011, the Clippers have sold out every regular season and postseason home game thanks to the starting uh, popularity of stars like Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan, and Chris Paul. So that's been a plus um, as well. But we always did have, I mean, we did have some draft picks that were good in the early 2000s. You had Darius Mile and Quentin Richardson. That was fun. You had Kenyon Dooley in that, on that team. Uh, but, I mean, we also had Elton Brand on the squad in the early 2000s. Uh, we did trade away Tyson Chandler's draft rights, so that was kind of dumb. Um, we ended up trading Darius Miles away for Andre Miller, which I never understood that trade um, because we weren't a point guard away from making the playoffs. I'm just saying. <laughs> that that's all that's all i'm saying 2755 is what we went that year by the way uh so yeah and then we lose a bunch of players and then mike dunleavy senior takes over 28 and 54 not a you know not a really great deal hey we finally get our own practice facility though and then and then we finally won a playoff game for the first time in 13 years in 2006 um, so that was, and they were, so that was a plus. And also we went up 2-0 against an opponent for the first time in, in franchise history. However, lost game three, won game four, and on May 1st, they won game five. This would mark the first playoff series win since they moved from Buffalo. And that was in 2006. They then went on to face the Suns and lost that one. So, Yeah. Let's uh, just jump ahead. Blake Griffin, first overall pick, brings the help to, uh, to clear a spot in the lineup for him. They traded Zach Rudolph to Memphis and Quentin Richardson. Uh, Richardson was ended up trading to the t- to the T-Wolves for Sebastian Telfair, Craig Smith, and Mark Madsen. Oh, yeah, we all know Mark Madsen. He loved to dance. So there was that. And then you had, so then you had um, – so then in 2011, we ended up with Lob City right but you want to know really something funny we had a chance at Kyrie Irving I'm just saying because with an improved uh Gordon Stalwart came in uh the Clippers showed strength with three of their first four wins against the from the top teams in the Western Conference uh in 2010 uh and then or 2011, I should say. And then he also won the NBA Slam Dunk Con- Griffin won the Slam Dunk Cost and Rookie of the Year. As the trade deadline, the approach, the Clippers did Sam Baron Davis, along with their first round pick, to the Cleveland Cavaliers for Mo Williams and Jamario Moon. We could have had Kyrie flipping Irving. Great management. 
Then we sign Karan Butler, obviously Chauncey Billups, and then we bring on Lob City, baby. Lob City was a lot of fun. Lob City was the best time ever. Got Doc Martin or Doc Rivers in here, and we've actually haven't really since we got that, and the franchise has actually turned up as well. Then you had the Donald Sterling controversy because again, David Stern said that in 1983 this was a franchise. This was a fantastic franchise. Needless to say, he ended up finally having to sell the team and got a lifetime ban because he's a racist piece of garbage. And that was the happiest day I've ever seen in my life. And you know what? Steve Ballmer paid cash for the team, which is even better yet. So, love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. And then we did a rebuild, which wasn't really much of a rebuild because we still made the playoffs. And now we got the Kawhi Leonard and Paul George era, which has yet to turn up anything. Uh, we've made one Western Conference Finals appearance since they've showed up, which we lost to, to the Suns. Um, we t- we lost a 3-1 lead thanks to Doc Rivers because he only did that twice for us. So that's all. Just saying. And he also did it for the Magic. So that's how that worked out. But, hey, good news is we got James Harden now, so things are looking up. But I'm telling you right now, it's not going to be all – rainbows and sunshine and all this other bs that everybody's trying to make it out to be because even though we got westbrook and harden and paul george and Kawhi leonard injuries are still a factor and chemistry is another factor and tyra tyron Lou is probably the guy that i want to be able to handle all of this so thank you tyron Lou, for being our head basketball coach for the los angeles clippers also we are building a new arena in inglewood california so we're finally going to get our own stadium and it's going to be the Inuit Intuit Dome uh, located south of SoFire Stadium and it's actually going to be great it's on the old forum where the forum used to be um, so it's going to be in Inglewood it's going to be great it's going to be our first actual own stadium ever so thank you Steve Ballmer for that and I can't wait for 2024 for that to come up as well we also got a new practice facility as well so it's going to be great i love it so there's the quick history of being a clippers fan and as we are talking about this the clippers lost 126 to 144 against the dallas mavericks tonight so that's always fun as well all right Thanks for going through my quick history of what it's like to be a Clippers fan and how sucky they have been in my entire life. Now, well, let's get on to fun stuff. Let's get on to the Swami's Picks, where we went, uh, I think, 9-4 and four last week, right? No, 9-5, and five, I think it was, 9-5. and five. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, uh, 4. Yeah, five. So we went nine and five last week. Um, and we are currently 76 and 61 on the season. And we are so far 0 and 1 this week because we picked Carolina against the Bears and that didn't happen. So let's start off with the game that's in Germany is Indiana Colts versus the New England Patriots. And we're going Indy. We got next up, we got Houston and Cincy. Uh, Cincinnati, I know T. Higgins isn't playing. I know Jamar Chase is might not be playing. So, might have issues, but I think Cincinnati pulls off the win there. Saints, Vikings, we're going Vikings at home with Josh Dobbs. Packers, Steelers at Pittsburgh, we're going Steelers. We got Tennessee Titans and Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Give me Baker Mayfield. I'm still in the Bakerfield bandwagon right here. Maybe three and five, but I think they can pull off this win. Next up, we got San Francisco and Jacksonville. We're going San Francisco off the bye, going to Jacksonville and getting the win. Next up after that, we got Cleveland and Baltimore, taking Baltimore at home. Uh, I, I mean, Cleveland could could win. I wouldn't be shock, I wasn't shocked by it. And then we're going to go upset of the week. Uh, we're going Cardinals over Falcons. Kyler Murray's first game back. We're taking the Cardinals over the Falcons. Uh, the three o'clock game on Sunday features the Lions Chargers out in SoFi. We're taking the Lions, Cowboys Giants. God, I hope we don't get that game. Cowboys by a lot. 
at home. Uh, then you got the Commanders out in Seattle. Seattle at home, of course. The 7 o'clock game on NBC that night is going to be the Raiders-Jets. 4-4 four and four Jets versus the 4-5 and five Raiders. Thank you, NBC, for not flexing that game out because that's going to be a good one. And we're going to take the Raiders. AP is going to get the team back to 500. And then on Monday night, you got the Denver Broncos and the Buffalo Bills at Orchard Park. And we're taking the Bills. So there you have it for the for this week's uh, NFL picks. Now, what do we got going on in college? Well, we got, like I said earlier, we got number three, Michigan, versus number 10, Penn State, on Fox at 11 a.m. on Saturday afternoon uh, with Jim Harbaugh, not on the sidelines. Uh, we got Alabama, Kentucky on ESPN at 11. Uh, we got Nebraska, Maryland uh, at 11 on Peacock. Uh, the uh, Colorado plays Arizona on the Pac-12 network at, at Boulder. So let's see if Colorado can get a win there. They are two wins away from a um, – they need two wins out of the last three to make a bowl game. So let's see if Prime – Dion Primetime Sanders can pull that off. Their offense is looking very sluggish. Shadir Sanders is definitely holding the ball on too long and isn't getting rid of it at all sometimes so it's a lot of frustration there i'm sure but we got to get it done i think they do win on i think they win tomorrow and i think they win the next week and then they lose against utah because the following week they play washington state uh, another top 25 game is at 230 on fox which is going to feature the utah utes versus the washington huskies up in washington and we're taking the huskies uh at 230 on cbs you got tennessee and missouri and we'll go Missouri at home. Then you have at 2.30 on the Big Ten Network, you have the Rut you have Rutgers Scarlet Knights versus Iowa at Kinnick, where it's going to be the lowest scoring game of the weekend. And I'm projecting the score is going to be 10-4. to 4. That's right. The Scarlet Knights are going to get two safeties. I doubt they're going to get four. But we'll say seven. We'll be like 10-7. to 7. Because the Hawkeyes defense doesn't do squat and the Rutgers defense doesn't do squat. Somehow Iowa's ranked 22nd. I don't know how that is possible. Uh, you got Minnesota Purdue at 2:30 as well on NBC. Uh, Minnesota can, needs to continue to win if they want to inside track to the mm, Big Ten West title. Uh, let's see. You got ooh a really good one. You got Old Miss at Georgia at 6 p.m. on ESPN. Lane Kiffin goes into Athens. See if they upset Georgia. Uh, Georgia, I think, is just finding ways to win, and that's all they're doing at this point. So, and then the Mountain West game of the night is going to be Air Force and Hawaii. I mean, realistically, <laughs> the only other options is New Mexico, Boise State. Probably not a thing. That, that is on FS1, though. Uh, and then you also have Fresno State and Santa Jose State on CBS Sports Network. But I'm going Air Force Hawaii on the Mountain West Channel. So, there's your football games for this weekend. There's our NFL picks. This podcast is now at the 48-minute mark, which is way longer than what I thought it was going to be. But we, uh, we talked a lot about the Clippers and, you know, broke down about 50 years of horrible history. All right, 50? Yeah, 53 years of horrible history. Because let's a real quick summation of how bad the Clippers have been. They have had only uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen winning seasons in their history and Nine of those have come since 2012. Oh, actually, 10 of those have come again since 20, since the 2012-2013 season. 10 of the 15 seasons that they've had a winning record is right there. So, yeah. Oh, love it. Just love it. Please, please, please. You know, I was a Cubs fan. Been a Cubs fan, and it took... You know, most of my entire life for them to win a World Series. Uh, I have not seen the Raiders. 
I seen the Raiders in the Super Bowl one time because uh, obviously I was very young when they won a Super Bowl in the '80s. Clippers. Um, I got hey, I got the Golden Knights though. The Golden Knights got a Stanley Cup, so I guess two out of four ain't bad, right? So, all right, boys and girls, children of all ages, I appreciate you listening to me this week. And if somebody can tell me what the last phrase I said on last week's podcast, I will give them a nickel. So, again, make sure to check out uh, the podcast. Make sure you check out the stream on Twitch, One Guy With a Mic. Follow me on Twitter, uh, One Guy With a Mic. Follow me on TikTok, One Guy With a Mic. And make sure you ring that bell, subscribe, follow, whatever you got to do to get a reminder when this podcast drops. And I'll be back here next week with more fantastic sports knowledge as well. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before I go, one last thing. If you do not know who Craig Hodges is, you need to Google him. And you need to watch the 93 three-point championship. Because that guy won three straight three-point championships. He had two, and he also had three second places as well. Two against Larry Bird and one against Dell Davis. Okay, the third straight championship that he won, he did that in a white NBA jersey because he was a free agent at the time, and the league let him uh, challenge or let him defend his title, which, by the way, was an awesome gesture of the league at the time, and he ended up winning it as a free agent, so he still ended up getting money from the NBA. So for winning that as well. So there's a little bit of tid, tid a little bit of fun fact on uh, Craig Hodges. So all right, y'all have a great weekend. I'll be back here next week on, uh, and we'll be talking more football, and um, we'll be talking about history about some sorts as well. All right, all right. Thank you again, everybody.